I'm very happy to be here today uh, with, with all of you and share a little bit of my story. Some of you might know it. I know Farm Credit was incredibly generous and, and gave out a lot of my books uh, over the last year. So how many people here have read the book, The Growing Season? Raise your hand if you've read it. A couple of things that I thought about on my drive uh, into town this morning was, you know, really kind of where we find ourselves in this really sort of weird time, not just in our country, um, but in, in the world and what we've all kind of been through with COVID. And I was reflecting, I spent a lot of my time traveling um, to our various farms and locations. Fry Farms has, we have farms in seven different states now where we grow fruits and vegetables. And the reason that we have spread out was to lengthen our growing season. And, you know, when the world shut down because of COVID, it was right at about the time when our Florida crop was just getting ready to be harvested. And like all of you, I mean, we plant the seeds and then we kind of hope for the best, right? I always say that farmers are, believe it or not, the most optimistic people that I know because, I mean, we, we kind of live on hope. Yeah, it's gonna work out. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but you know what? We get up and we do it the next year and we do it the next year and, you know, with the good partners like Farm Credit, we're able to continue to do it. But I remember I was actually in Manhattan, was the last flight that I took pre-COVID, and I was getting ready to fly down to the farm in Florida because we were getting ready to harvest. I had been in New York meeting with a customer and I was talking to my oldest son, William, and he said, Mom, you know, I keep, you know, I keep getting these alerts on my phone about this coronavirus and, you know, uh, it's coming from China, da, 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 da. I think you should just come, come back home, come to the hill. That's what we call where I live now and grew up, we call it the hill. And I thought, you know, I think he might be right. So I immediately got on my phone, I switched my flight, and I flew back, and it was done after that. There was no really traveling anywhere. So I have four older brothers that work with me in the business, and at that time we thought, well, if the world's shutting down, and we have this crop that has to be harvested, millions of dollars laying in the ground in Hendry County, Florida, which if you're somewhat familiar with Florida, like think of the beach location, so about 45 minutes from Fort Myers Beach, right? We have this crop of watermelons. And at that time, when things shut down, our neighbors all around us, other farmers, they were in the middle of their harvest. We were getting ready to begin, but they were in the middle of their harvest. And everything just stopped. And we watched as they tilled up thousands of acres, millions of dollars, worth of delicious fresh fruits and vegetables at a time when the country was very unsure about their food supply. So the five of us, my four older brothers and I, I have Ted, John, Harley, and Leonard, we got together and we said, okay, well, we don't, we don't really know what's gonna happen. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty at that time. Who's gonna get sick? Who's gonna have to stay home? Who's gonna, so John and I stayed behind in Southern Illinois and Leonard and Harley, who were already in Florida said, we'll stay here, we get sick, then you guys come down. But we're gonna, we're gonna try to figure out how we can get this crop harvested. And frankly, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, I thought, man, this is gonna be it for our business. It's done, it's, it's over, because we, we can't sustain these hits. And fortunately, we were able to begin to harvest that crop and the retailers weren't particularly sure that if we could even get it on trucks at the time, if there was going to be a market for watermelons because people were talking about fresh fruits and vegetables not being safe to eat. Remember when everybody was getting their groceries and they were like spraying them down the Lysol, ordering them online, not bringing them in the house for like two or three days. So I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, how do you pick a watermelon? A human hand has to touch it and pick it up and put it on a truck. So, my kids actually ended up doing something really incredible right here at home. They started a, a fresh produce drive through because at the time, William, my oldest son, 
was listening to me have these conversations with all of these super, super intelligent people in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, these, these folks really know what's going on out there, right? So I was calling them. I, I, that was a joke. Uh, but I needed to be able to get our workforce, because they were shutting down the border at the time, and I needed to be able to get our legal H-2A workers into the country to harvest the crop. And so he was overhearing those conversations. Then he was overhearing the conversations, because mind you, remember, the kids are at home from school now. And I have two teenagers sitting at the dining room table trying to help them do algebra. I was never meant to be a teacher. But anyway, they're listening to these conversations. They're hearing the conversations that I'm having with the retailers about you know, pricing and whether they're going to be able to sell the crop if we can actually give it, get it harvested, et cetera, et cetera. So Will says to me one day, he gets very frustrated, he'd been on his laptop, and he said, Mom, yeah, I, I have to have, what can I do to help? And I had one of these sort of like, you have these moments as a parent sometimes, and you're under all of this incredible stress, and you might snap just a little bit at your kids. And I said, you know what you could do, William? You could sell some watermelons. That's what you could do. That's what you could do. You could sell some watermelons. That's how you could help. A little sarcastic, but he didn't catch the sarcasm. He said, okay, Mom, I'll sell some watermelons. He said, uh, I'll do it this weekend out at the warehouse. So if anybody's ever been to Papertown, Illinois, that's technically where I live. So it's about 20 minutes northeast of here, and there are three houses and an old shut down general store. Not a big population to sell a bunch of watermelons to, right? Especially when it's like freezing cold. But I had said it, I felt bad about it, so we brought a lot of, load of watermelons up for the kids to sell that weekend. They get the watermelons on a Saturday morning. They start setting them up out at the warehouse. Seven o'clock in the morning, they're, they're there. They've got lat COVID lab coats on. They've got safety goggles. They got the mask. They're, they get, they're, they're wrapped in rubber gloves. And they're setting up this cute little stand out at the warehouse. And I think to myself, I drive over there, and they're setting these watermelons up in this cute little display. And I think to myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go home now and call the neighbors and see if I can get some people to come over here and buy watermelons from them. They're never going to sell all these watermelons. What are we going to do? Oh, this is going to be like their first entrepreneurial thing and they're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to feel bad because they're going to have this whole similar little watermelons that they can't sell. So I drove home to start calling neighbors, all three of them, to come over and buy watermelons for, from the kids. And about 45 minutes later, I get a call from my brother Johnny. He's at the where He said, Sarah, get over here right now. Oh, my God. He's like, we're loading these. I, we need your help. I'm out of breath. John Fry's out of breath. Said, What's going on? I was just there. They were setting up the watermelons. They had like 50 watermelons set up on a piece of plywood out there with a cute little hand painted sign. What, what do you mean you're busy? So I leave my house, and I drive back over to the, to the Fry Farms warehouse, and I can't get to the warehouse because the cars are lined up past the county line. There are 100 cars lined up to get watermelons. So I'm, I'm like, what is going on? So I drive in there and then I see the neighbors and heck, I even think Heather's in the drive through line. Maybe Brad's there too, I don't know. I'm like, where are all these people come from? We had people drive from Chicago, Evansville, St. Louis, you know, and then, and then all of the counties around here to buy watermelons from the kids. So I jump out. I haven't worked that hard in 25 years. I'm out there pitching watermelons in people's cars. I'm like, oh my gosh. Kids have a trash can. People are throwing $5 bills out the window and they're landing in the, in the trash can so they're not touching the money. The kids sold out of watermelons, a whole semi load of watermelons in less than two hours. Now by this time, the cars are backed up even further and we're out of watermelons. And I'm like, oh my God. Now what am I going to do with all these people? I'm not used to dealing directly with the public. We're used to like, you sell it to Walmart, they go sell it, and they deal with the public. And now I'm like, oh, these people are going to be so upset. Well, fortunately, we had a load of watermelons sitting over at our plant in Indiana that we brought back over. So in a matter of about five and a half hours, the kids sold two semi-loads of watermelons. And I just remember thinking, that even in the darkest and most uncertain times, we can find good. And that day, for me, was one of the most magnificent days because I saw my kids engaged on the farm, in the business, 
and hustling and trying to do what they could do to help. And it helped probably more than Walmart coming in and buying 300 semi loads of watermelons because it helped my outlook. And it helped me realize that it reminded me, really, that if you can see past all of life's imperfections and what's going on around you and ultimately search for the good, you can find it and you can find a higher purpose in tough times that you're going through. So that experience re-energized me and made me get a little more aggressive about things that were going on in our business and making things happen. But it also reminded me of the optimism of a farmer. Fortunately for us, we were able to sell that crop. And then I watched as Will and Luke, as they were running their drive through then they decided, hey, we need to do this every Saturday. We're not going to school, why not? They started calling other farmers in South Florida, farmers that weren't able to move their crops, and they started buying fresh produce, bringing it up here to cold, old southern Illinois, where they were able to sell it at their drive through on Saturdays. And seeing their sense of pride in their community and their servants' hearts made me also realize that the greatest thing I've ever done in my life um, was raise these two incredibly wonderful, hardworking, good sons. And um, all of my nieces as well, Anna and Audrey, you know, they helped out the kids from their high school, because these kids had nothing to do, right? They're home from school, they're looking into a computer screen, they didn't have anything to do. So they were all coming out and working on the farm. And I realized how incredibly blessed I was to live in this community and to be from Southern Illinois and to have my roots here and to raise my kids here. And so I just tell you this story because we're at this really weird point in the world. I don't, it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're on, doesn't matter, none of that matters. What the fact of the matter is, things are weird right now. They're super weird. And they continue um, to, times continue to be very uncertain. And you know, at times there's fear and you're thinking about, you know, well, what's going to happen, you know, to our market prices and, you know, Brad and I were just talking earlier about China and Russia. Well, you know, I mean, if you, Ukraine can't get their exports out, what happens, you know, that their prices, maybe that's, you know, ultimately not a bad thing for our farmers, but, you know, what if China and Russia are getting together and this is an opportune, opportune time to do something to our country. One thing and really it's sort of the only thing that gives me hope is I've had the opportunity to go into a lot of rural communities, just like the rural community in which we all live and make our livings in over the last year. And um, I see the best of America when I go into these rural communities. I see the people that weren't afraid to continue to work throughout uncertainty and fear and I see the people who are ultimately getting up every day, they're putting their boots on and they're going out there and they're making it happen day after day. And that's the thing that gives me hope for the future. And it's the, also the thing that allows me to believe that no matter what happens in our country or in the world, that we're gonna be okay. Because there's a lot of people just like you spread throughout the country in little different areas, uh, you know, little, little unknown pockets of the country who are smart, hardworking, courageous people. They get out there and do it every day, and that's, that's what you all do. I mean, you probably don't think of yourselves as like, oh, I'm like a superhero, or I'm real courageous, or I have no fear, or, you know, sometimes you might feel like you're not the most optimistic person in the world, but you really are. So I tell that story because just for a moment I want all of you to take a moment and, and to realize how incredibly important the work is that you do every single day. 
and how important and how valuable you are to our country as a whole. And not too many people take the time, you know, you hear these, they get these little catchy sayings, oh, hey, thank a farmer, blah, 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 you know, like, yeah, no, nobody really thinks about it. But you all are the backbone of America, and you're, you're getting out there and you're doing it every day, and you obviously, clearly, you're, you're, here, you're here today, so you have an interest in your business and continuing it, whether it's for future generations um, or not. And the work you do is so incredibly vital and important to our country, so I wanna say thank you for that. Um, one other thing I kinda wanted to, to touch base on is uh, I talk about it a little bit in, in my book, and it's, it's really, it took me, in writing the book was an incredibly difficult process for me because you had, it's not a business book, it's kind of a memoir, and memoirs are like sort of sappy things that you have to dig deep. And the process was actually quite grueling because I had to throw up everything that ever happened to me in my whole entire life, get it all out on paper, read it, have a breakdown, and then say, okay, I'm gonna put this in the book, but no, this is coming back. But you had to get it all out there first before you were a, before I was able to actually put the words on paper to be printed. Um, that was an incredibly difficult but cathartic process for me um, to go through. But one of the themes, and I didn't know this when I started to write the book, it just sort of evolved, was how do you do more with less? So I was raised on an 80 acre farm um, I had four older brothers, and as you know, in, in, in corn and, you know, traditional row crop farming, 80 acres really isn't a lot, and it certainly isn't going to support the livelihoods of five kids. But when I bought the farm at a very young age, I had to figure out, how do I do more with less? And fresh fruits and vegetables happen to be what I was selling. And I think, uh, you know, Jeff said, oh, she was selling melons out of the back of her pickup truck when she was 16 years old. Um, that was a really nice way to describe it because I actually look like a carnival act rolling through town. And I don't know if many of you ever saw the big old loads of watermelons in the back of a pickup truck, but um, you might have even passed them on the highway because half the time I was working with equipment that was old and, and broke down. But I kind of looked like a carnival act at that point, but I had to figure out how do I do more with less? And ultimately, when my brother John and Ted and I were standing around and we're looking at this rolling piece of 80 acres clay dirt, which we call the hill, we had to figure out how to do more with less because we knew we couldn't plant corn, we knew we couldn't plant soybeans, heck, we didn't have a, a tractor, a planter, a combine, we didn't even have the equipment to go do that. But we could plant pumpkins. And the pumpkins that we would grow would produce more revenue per acre and would also require us to have less acreage. So, ding, 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 light bulb goes off, okay, we're gonna plant pumpkins. And then we're gonna sell it to the retailers in which you're, you know, I'm driving around my pickup truck selling the melons to the uh, independent grocery stores. And then I had actually started selling melons and things to Walmart stores at the time. Back when many of you probably remember a Walmart store is what we would call a division one store. Remember before they had groceries and they expanded and became these big old super centers? Well, you could like buy bread and chips and maybe a gallon of milk, but they didn't have all the, all the stuff that we know Walmart has today. Um, but I was actually selling them some melons at the time. And fortunately for us, uh, they were in the market to buy pumpkins too. Because pumpkins were something that didn't require refrigeration. They could set them out in front of their store, and et cetera. And, Ultimately, that's how I started the, the journey with Walmart. And then I remember driving this pickup truck and trailer on um, the highway, 
headed toward Vincennes, Indiana, because we used to deal with a lot of farmers over in Vincennes that grew melons, and I'd buy their melons, I'd take them out, and then I'd go sell them, and then I'd end up back at the farm that night to buy some more melons to head out the next day. So I'm driving, driving through, uh, I think it's what is that, Highway 50 that goes past uh, the Olney Distribution Center. And I see this big building being erected, and there's a sign outside that says, Walmart DC 6059 coming soon. This is like 1996, I think. Um, and I'm driving my big Ford red one ton dually, pulling a Hillsboro trailer behind it. I'm empty at this point because I've got my melons unloaded. And I see this building and I see the sign and the building's not quite finished yet. But I thought, Walmart, wow, you know what? Instead of having to go to every single one of those stores and drop the melons off and have to hand unload them, because back then they weren't, in pallet, they weren't on pallets and they weren't on bins. And so when I drop off 100 watermelons at a, at a Walmart store, you'd have to have a couple of associates come out and then you'd have to unload them out of the back of the truck or the trailer and put them in carts and push them into the store. I thought, gee, wouldn't it be easy if I could just go to that one building? and drop off all of my stuff, and then they could figure out how to get it to their stores. I mean, that's the teenager thought, right? You know, like I wasn't really thinking through like all of the logistics and the things that would need to happen or the, the technologies or the investments that we would need to make to be able to even service that distribution center. But I just decided to stop in. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't open yet, but I decided to stop. Well, what's it gonna do? Like, you know, they can't say yes if you don't ask. And the warehouse wasn't staffed yet, so no one stopped me at the door. There was no security guard or anyone. And I'm walking around in this big distribution center. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just like, oh, do do do. Finally, a man comes over to me and says, Miss, can I help you? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, are you guys going to be bringing produce through here? And he says, well, as a matter of fact, we are. And there's a woman that's going to buy it, and she's in her office, setting her office up right now. And, oh, good, could I meet her? Yep. And so, just in that, like, that instant, and that little chance, and that chance meeting, and that just, oh, I'm just going to stop in and check it out, I was introduced to this woman named Laura Marshall. Now, Laura Marshall was under her desk when I met her and she was hooking up her computer and she was very frazzled because she had just gotten this promotion. She came out of a store and she had just gotten this promotion to the, an actual buyer position at this warehouse. So she stands up, she looks at me. I'm a scrawny, dirty-faced kid that had just unloaded a bunch of melons wearing a ball cap and a ponytail and uh, work boots. And she says, uh, who are you? And I said, well, my name's Sarah Fry, and I happened to sell your, your store some watermelons, and I just got through unloading them. Wasn't expecting to meet you today, but I take melons and things directly to your stores and supply you. She said, oh my God, I'm so happy you're here. I thought she was gonna kick me out of her office. She said, oh my God, she, oh, you're happy I'm here? She said, when this place opens, I'm gonna need three loads of watermelons every week and two loads of cantaloupes. Can you do that? I said, well, yeah, yeah, I can do that, absolutely, I can do that. And uh, anyway, she shakes my hand, we exchange numbers. She said, make sure you get the right vendor agreement, yada, yada, yada. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, no problem. And as I'm walking out of the distribution center that day, this is before my brother John and my brother Ted came home to help me in the business. As I'm walking out of the DC, I think, loads, she said loads. But then the switch flips and I realize she's not talking about a pickup truck and a trailer load. She's talking about semis. I go, oh, what am I gonna do? I don't have a CDL, I don't know how to drive a big semi truck, how am I gonna, how am I, oh man, and I just told her I was gonna do it. But you know what, I'll figure it out. So I do what I always do and I call John Fry, my brother. He's down in Louisville, Kentucky, and I said, John, I think, I'm not quite sure, but I think we might, I might have just done something that will allow the family to come home and be able to work together. And 
I said, I, I need your help. It was 48 hours later. Everything John Fry owned in the back of a fire, uh, old primered Firebird was sitting in my driveway. And he had a, some computer equipment and stuff. I thought, okay, all right, we're in business. I said, but the first thing I need you to do is go to Chicago and go to learn how to drive a semi. So he was home for less than 24 hours before I sent him up to Chicago to work and train and learn how to drive a semi. And then, and then we all had to learn um, how to drive them. And ultimately, each, with each brother that came home and joined me in the business after that, um, we'd get our CDLs. And then they'd, they'd go out on the road, and they were hauling the produce. So I was buying the produce from the farms. And then we were hauling the produce. And then ultimately, we were doing more with less on this little 80 acre farm. And um, that, was, that was the beginning of the journey and how it ultimately all got started for us. And as all of you know, sitting here today, you've probably, at any point, any given point in your life, where you're always, really, every day, as farmers, having to figure out how to do more with less. And that's, uh, that's something that ultimately, Many people would read or hear my story and say, wow, that girl was really disadvantaged and how and where she grew up and what she went through and yada, yada, yada. I think ultimately the disadvantage was my advantage in life. And I think that's true for everyone who chooses to look at it that way. Because the thing that, things that we ultimately go through in our life as long as we continue to remain optimistic and positive, we can always find the good. And ultimately, that, those things are, are what build us into the, the people and that we are and the character that we have to ultimately run our businesses, our families, our farms, and be successful. And fortunately, at a very early age in my life, I was surrounded by a whole host of, of characters who played into my story in one way or another, whether it was the guy named Dr. Diesel that helped me change tires at 3 o'clock in the morning on an overloaded, blown-out semi, you know, full of watermelons on I-57, two miles south of the scale house, you know, kept, kept myself and my brother from going to jail. I mean, to the Walmart buyer, Laura Marshall, who took a chance on a, you know, a baseball cap, boot-wearing teenage girl who, you know, had a few hot melons in the back of her pickup truck. So we all have people who are also part of our story. But one of the things that I have found is surrounding myself with people who are willing to support you and ultimately work with you on that journey because no one gets, no one like the turtle doesn't go to the top of the fence post, doesn't get there on his own, somebody has to put him there. And we all have these people in our lives. And I think our, our partners, we do business with Farm Credit, and I think our partners at Farm Credit have also been folks who have been with us on that wild and crazy journey and who have helped us get to where we are today. So I'm thankful for that and I'm thankful for the, for the partnership that we've had with them and I'm sure many of you have plenty of stories that you can share on you know, the folks that have helped you along the way and also your, your business and with Farm Credit and, and their support of, of your farms and, and your, bus and your um, growing operations. So with that, I'm going to, if anybody's read the book and you have questions about the book, now's the time to ask them. So Josh just shared a quick story from the book. And it was, uh, you know, we had horses growing up, race horses. And they don't call it a king sport for nothing. But my, our father was certainly not a king. And, um, but he had this love and this crazy passion and almost obsession with these silly racehorses. And um, he never really wanted to sell any. And we had a, a breeding farm down here. And 
ultimately we'd get one and, and we'd spend a lot of money, send it to the racetrack, and it was like gambling, like farmers and gamblers too, right? We go out, we gamble every time we plant a crop. Well, he was a, a, kind of a, kind of had a double dose of that. So he did a little bit of farming and then he had these, these horses. But the story Josh told was about this one horse named Singing Unimac, who ultimately was like the one in, the, the one in, a hundred year horse, right? This horse would have been nominated for the Kentucky Derby. He was a two year old, just, and he was, you know, winning races left and right, and he ultimately got put in this big stake race. I think it was about a $75,000 stake race up in Chicago. And a horse from California came and uh, blew the turn, which means the horse on the inside went straight, and Singing Unimac was trying to make the turn. and and the horse took a spill, and it was done, it was over. But prior to that race and that horse being taken out with an injury, my father was offered an incredible amount of money, life-changing money, for this magnificent horse that he had. And he uh, had the opportunity to really change the trajectory of our, of our family and our life. He just sold that one horse. Wouldn't have been that big of a deal. He had 60 more back on the hill, you know? But he didn't take that opportunity, and then, and then the horse uh, ultimately, uh, you know, probably at that point should have been put down, but we, we brought him um, back to the farm, and he ended up being a stud horse for a while. But there was that moment in time and that opportunity to take advantage of, of something and that he didn't, but the, really the lesson in that is as a little girl knowing how poor we were and how you know, we were going without, you know, but the horses were eating, and seeing that horse, which was this magnificent creature that could have changed our lives, come off of that trailer in a cast, hobbling in a cast, um, ultimately, didn't, it didn't extinguish the light and the hope that I had for the future and the optimism for the future that, not that we could get a different horse or that we'd ever have another horse that would have that, you know, that we would have that same opportunity with, but that we could also, that we could make a change and we could do something very different with our life and our livelihood and still have those opportunities and not lose hope in that moment. And that was one of the hopeful moments from the book that I remember as a kid. It's already really affecting us. I think that, you know, obviously input costs are, are way up. I mean, we're seeing increases just in, in production well over, well over 20% and trying to pass those costs along to our retailers is, is like pulling teeth. I mean, everybody knows it costs more, but nobody wants to pay more for it. And I think that's, that's really kind of true in any industry. One of the other things that we continue to struggle with is the rising freight cost in our business because we have to move an extraordinary amount of, uh, we, we need a high volume of trucks and very short seasonal condensed windows wherever we're growing. So when we, we have a crop in the ground growing right now in South Florida and when that crop gets ready to come off, we need all the trucks in one rural area at one time and it'll come off very, very rapidly. And it's kind of like the need that we have with, with our workers. We use the H-2A program, which, which is a legal workforce program um, for people to travel into the country, perform the uh, job function, and leave. So we need, everyone says, well, why don't you use local labor? Why don't you use Americans? Well, trust me, believe me, I would love to use an American workforce. And it, believe it or not, it's not that Americans won't do the job. Because that's, that's usually the go-to. Well, Americans don't want to work that hard. They won't do the job. Uh, it's not really the problem. It's just people in rural communities are kind of used to working. There just aren't enough of them, right? So you need a high volume of workers in a very short period of time, in a short seasonal window. So that's why we use the guest worker program, because it allows us to get the number of workers we need for the short seasonal time frames in which we need them. 
They're happy, we're happy, they come here, they work, they help the farm, they return to their home country, they do it legally, they're able to, they're able to come back every year. Heck, some of the guys that we have uh, working for our company have been with us for over 20 years. And they're the same people coming back. Now their sons are coming or you know, their cousins, their brothers, whatever. And what's really great about that program is you have to pass a background check you have, to, uh, you have to have a completely clean record to be able to enter the US under that uh, guest worker visa program. And I actually feel safer around, around those folks than I do when I get off of an airplane at, at Reagan in, in DC and go up to Capitol Hill. I mean, it's like, I, you know, so lots of challenges in our business, but yes, back to your question about input costs. Yeah, we're, I mean, the rising, we're, we're all feeling that, that kind of pain.